and welcome to the Dr. Bob Show. There's nothing more beautiful than a young baby coming home from a hospital. But what if the baby comes home and begins having coughing and wheezing and shortness of breath and a tight cough or a rattling cough with wheezing, fighting for air? That's a very terrifying situation. Have to rush to the emergency room. Is it an infection with small airway? Is it due to a virus? Is it the beginning of allergy and asthma? What is causing a wheezy infant? We'll be spending most of this show talking about asthma in very early childhood. My guest is Dr. Karthik Krishnan. He is a board certified allergist. He's had emergency room training. He'll be answering our questions. Hello, I'm Dr. Robert Overholt. I'll be your host for the next 30 minutes on The Dr. Bob Show. Later on, we'll be talking about high blood pressure. Should everybody have a blood pressure cuff at home? What do the numbers tell us? More than you think. And obstructive sleep apnea secondary to snoring. How does it harm the body? A lot more than you think. And so we need to get that fixed. A lot of information for you. You'll want to stay tuned. We're talking with Dr. Karthik Krishnan, board certified allergist, emergency room training, and we're talking about a wheezing infant. Karthik, welcome to Dr. Bob's show. Thank you for having me. First of all, what is asthma? Let's start off with that. What's going on? Right. So asthma is a problem with the airways in the lungs, and there's two features to it. The one first feature is twitchiness or hyper-responsiveness of the airways. And the second feature is obstruction, which, which is caused by swelling or inflammation of the airways. So both of them, the twitchiness and the swelling inside, both of them can cause wheezing Correct. when the child tries to breathe in and out. Correct. How does, it, how does it feel as we get an adult? What does it feel like when they've got asthma? They feel like they've got air hunger? That's right. So the classic symptoms for asthma are coughing, wheezing, shortness of breath, and chest tightness. So a lot of times they'll say, I have trouble getting a full breath or I have trouble catching my breath and they feel like they're air hungry. So let's drop down into infancy when that child comes home like we talked and they're having cough and wheezing. Right. What's going on in that small baby? Yeah, so typically, so we're not born with asthma. Asthma develops over time. So it, during infancy, the most common cause for coughing and wheezing is usually an infection and most commonly a viral infection. And the most common one that we hear about is respiratory syncytial virus. That's or the RSV, RSV virus. Correct. And Can, that's the one that causes the wheezy infant. And when it causes a wheezing in an infant, mm -hmm. what's going on in the airway? You got a little baby, they got a small airway, and if you got an infection, what's going on? That's right. So what's happening is there's irritation or inflammation of the airway, and there's also a lot of mucus production in the airway. So there's not normal airflow, and there's not normal exchange of oxygen and blood. And so this is this, the baby is going to have to compensate. And so the baby has to breathe faster and harder, and this puts a lot of stress on the baby. Um, how do you know if it's a virus that's doing that, a respiratory syncytial virus? Are there tests for it? So there are tests for it. You can do what they call a nasal aspirate, and you can check for that virus in the nasal aspirate. So if you've got a child that's got an RSV, mm -hmm. viral infection, coughing and wheezing, how do you treat that? Right, so we'll have to do symptomatic treatment. What we mean by that is we have to try to support the baby to help the baby breathe easier. And a lot of times what we'll do is we'll make sure they're well hydrated. And another thing we can do is give them a medicine called albuterol. That's a fast acting medicine to help relax the airways, to open them up. And so some babies will respond to that if they have RSV. So how do you give the albuterol? Do you have to give it by an inhaler, liquid, mm -hmm. uh, nebulizer? What yeah. do you do? So during infancy, typically we have to give it through the nebulizer. And what we do is we take a liquid medicine and we aerosolize it. So it gets into the airways where it can help the baby breathe. And that really uh, must be very assuring to the mother when she sees the child. That's fine. That. 
Does a wheezy infant mean they're going to have asthma later on? Most of the time, all the time, maybe some of the time. Yeah, so most infants will cough and wheeze when they get sick with a cold. 60% will outgrow by the time they turn six years of age. 40% will continue to go on and wheeze. Of those 40%, 20 will go on to have asthma. The other 20, they'll, their wheezing will go away as they get older. So if somebody's having wheezing from RSV virus uh, up through six months, then they're going to maybe continue to six years of age. Correct. How do you treat that child? Do they have to be treated every day? Are they having wheezing every day or just when they get another cold? Yeah, so if it depends on the, the frequency and the severity of their symptoms. So that's one of the things we have to do is assess what we call impairment. How impactful is their symptoms to their um, activity, to their sleep? Are they having to go see their doctor a lot? Are they having to go to the emergency room? Are they requiring steroids by mouth to control their symptoms? So depending on the severity of their symptoms, we have to determine how to treat them. Now, if they're one year of age, mm -hmm. Allergies can come in at an early age. They right. can be there at six months or six weeks or at some time. How do you know if allergies are part of it or is one plus one equals two, RSV plus allergies? Um, it seems like it will be very difficult. How do you find out if there's an allergic component? Correct. So one simple thing we can do is we can do allergy skin testing and that'll help us identify if the, if the patient is allergic. And that will help us. There's something called the asthma predictive index. And one of the risk factors towards developing asthma is if they have a positive skin test. So skin testing gives us a window to help allow us to predict whether this child is at increased risk for developing asthma as they get older. And what age can you skin test a child? You can skin test it at any age. It's safe and it's quick and it's easy. And we do it at different ages to get different information. So during infancy and, and when a child's a toddler, we just want to get that information to see if they have that increased risk factor to develop asthma later on in life. So some of the allergens that they would show up to would be like what? So they can show up to pollens, they can show up to dust mite. Hey, wow, they that can, early. So pollen, right. dust, what else? Cat, dog, Cat, dog mold. mold. Correct. Wow, so they can have the full gamut of allergies. Correct. Do you suspect foods at that age? Yes, food's also a, a common trigger at that age. Common ones are milk, egg, wheat, soy, peanut. Those are major food allerg allergens so at that age. So it's a real detective sort of game as to mm -hmm. what's going on. Skin testing's part of it. Correct. Understanding if it's a virus. Correct. Treating properly to keep the child doing well. Um, do you allow them, let's say at age one or two, can they go to daycare? Can they go to a nursery at church? Can they do those mm -hmm. things? Yes, we'd like no restrictions. We like, we, if they're, um, we'd like them to stay in daycare. If they want to go to the church nursery, they're um, free to do that. Now, we have some extreme cases where kids just continually get sick and everything and, and whatever we do just doesn't seem to get them better. And in those situations, it may be worthwhile to pull them out of daycare for a little while, but if we can, we try not to. So um, I feel pretty comfortable if somebody's got a respiratory syncytial virus mm -hmm. that there's a reasonable chance that they're going to do well without asthma later on. What is the allergic march? You, I hear that word all the time. What does that mean yeah. in a young child? Okay, so that's the progression of allergic diseases in children. So. Like I said, when you're, they're born, they're not, they're not born with asthma. That's gonna develop over time. So the initial allergic disease that we commonly see in infants is eczema or atopic dermatitis. What does that look like? Eczema or atopic dermatitis Correct. in somebody less than six months. What does it look like? Correct, so that's dry, red, itchy patches of skin. And you commonly see it on the elbows, behind the knees. You can see it on the face, on the cheeks, um, and it's it's real itchy and it's, and it's bothersome. So that's a sign that that child's pretty allergic Correct. and you're gonna go on from allergic skin, Correct. eczema, atopic dermatitis to what other illnesses? Then it, then it goes to the nose. Uh -huh. So you get the allergic nose, allergic rhinitis, and that usually starts presenting around two, three years of life. What are the um, symptoms? 
Okay, so they'll have runny nose, sneezing, itchy nose, and congestion. Those are the classic symptoms. And again, you can skin test and find out if Correct. it's allergy. Correct. And the skin testing will tell us if foods or something is bothering the skin. Correct. Uh, as it continues, can it go on to asthma? Yes, it can. So that's the and final. That's what we're going to be talking about when we come back. That's the final part, I think Dr. Christian was saying, of the allergic march. So we'll see about childhood asthma and we'll see how we help the skin and the nose and the lungs. It gets more and more complicated as infection and different triggers occur. A lot of information. Want to stay tuned. We're talking with Dr. Karthik Krishnan, board certified allergist. We've been talking about wheezing in infancy, cough, wheeze, short of breath, Gasping for air can be due to a virus. Somebody can be the beginning of the allergic march, which was eczema, going later on into allergic nose, and then going to allergic lungs. That would be asthma. That would be asthma. So we go back to what you said initially with the asthma there. So let's say we've got a five-year-old okay. that's got hay fever and asthma and itchy skin. What do you do at that time? Do you skin test at that age? Do you treat with different medicines? What do you do to help the family and the mother? Okay, yeah, so the first thing, of course, is we always start with the history. Make sure we get a good history to get what the symptoms are, the pattern, the severity, um, and then we do the physical exam, and then we can do testing. So there's a couple forms of testing that we'll do. So for the asthma, for the breathing problems, we can do lung function testing when they turn five. And this, the specific testing that we do, it's called spirometry. It's a way to assess their lung function. It gives us numbers to see if they're typical for asthma. And what we're looking for is we're looking for an obstructive pattern on their lung functions. If they have this obstructive pattern, that makes it definitive for asthma. So there are certain numbers of the obstruction that makes the spirometry show that this is definitely asthma. Correct. So when that happens, when you de make the definite diagnosis, you now yep. know it, okay. you take the spirometry for the, the viewers is when the doctor says, blow, 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 right, blow. Right. And so yep. they're giving you a time over three to six seconds. Correct, correct. All right, so they made the diagnosis. Uh, you then do skin testing to find correct. out? So, and the reason why we do skin testing is because 80% of patients with asthma also have allergic rhinitis. So you can't overlook the nose. We have to assess the nose as well. If you so, leave it alone, in the nose alone, if you just say, well, that's, you know, that's not as bad as the allergic lungs, uh, then the lungs don't do as well? Correct. So you, we aggressively have to treat the nose as well to get the patient to feel under good control. So how do you, what's the treatment that you use for the five-year-old that has abnormal spirometry and has hay fever, how do you treat those? Okay, so there's gonna be two medication options. The first medication is a controller or preventative medication. And this is typically an inhaled corticosteroid. Some common brand names are Arnuti, Flovent, Qvar, Asminex. And these are medicines that they have to take on a daily basis. Why do they be, have to take them every day? What is it, what's it doing? So what it does, it's, it's a steroid that's delivered directly into the airways. And what it does is it decreases the inflammation or the swelling in the airway to remove the obstruction. When the swelling goes away, and then we breathe. But we've got to keep on it on a regular basis. Correct. Or what happens? Then their symptoms will come back. And the swelling comes back. Correct. So that's a controller, what's a reliever? Yeah, so the reliever medicines are fast acting, they're rescue, I, I tell patients, um, they're like fire extinguishers, they put out fires. <laughs> and so the common one, the medicine is albuterol, the brand names are Provental, Ventolin, Pro-Air, and these um, are quick acting inhalers, you can do two puffs um, every four hours as needed, and you should get relief within 15 minutes of using it. Now, if you've got a five and six year old, they get out and they play and they run hard and they get a little sweat head and they come in coughing. Um, it, does exercise, is that a trigger for asthma? Yes, that's a common trigger for asthma. So how do you, do you treat that with albuterol before they run or after they run or when? Yeah, so there's a couple ways to do it. A couple um, simple things you can do. One of the theories for exercise induced asthma or bronchospasm is that the airways get dried out. 
So I always encourage kids to make sure they're well hydrated. Um, if they're participating in sports, make sure they warm up really well. And they can do two puffs of albuterol 10 to 15 minutes before they start practicing or participating in activity. And that can keep them from wheezing with the exercise? Correct. So we want the children, we encourage exercise? Yes, absolutely. So exercise is a trigger, infection is a trigger, allergy is a trigger. What yes. can be some of the other triggers in childhood asthma? Yes, yeah, so I call them noxious stimuli. So that includes secondhand smoke, air pollution, um, exhaust fumes, um, strong odors like potpourri, perfumes, colognes. Um, the other thing that, that sometimes gets overlooked are emotions. When kids get upset or angry or stressed, that can also trigger asthma symptoms. Does asthma occur mainly during the day when a child's out playing or mainly in the middle of the night when mom and dad are trying to sleep? It's usually at night, and that's what brings the patients into the office is the parents say, um, we hear them coughing throughout the night and that keeps the child up and it keeps the family up. And so they know something's going wrong. It's just not normal. Correct. Now, tell me about the skin testing technique in a small child who's, by that I mean, let's say they're five years of age, you've had spirometry. Correct. What is the skin testing like? Yeah, so what we do is we take drops of different allergens. So we can take tree pollen, grass pollen, weed pollen. We put it on their back. We take a plastic toothpick and we gently prick the skin and we wait 15 minutes and we'll get a result. A positive result will look like a mosquito bite. It'll have a pale, puffy central area and a red area around it and it itches. Um, and so whatever positive reactions will look like mosquito bites. It's quick, easy and safe and it takes 15 minutes. So that tells you if they're allergic to pollen in the spring, pollen in the fall. You said dust, you said mold, you said dogs and cats. So there's a myriad of things and foods that can be bothering the child. When you do the skin testing, can you tell people to avoid certain things? Does yes. that lead into immunotherapy? So talk about avoidance and immunotherapy. Yeah, so the three options we have are avoidance measures. So depending on what their triggers are, we tailor an avoidance therapy plan. We have medications that we can use to um, treat the nose. And then our thir third option, our best option is immunotherapy, because that, that option actually treats the underlying problem, which is the immune system overreacting to allergens. And so that will get us the best control of their nose, their skin, and their asthma. So it's really very, very complicated, but you've got to identify what's going on. Correct. You have to try and avoid. You have to treat before they get into trouble sometimes, and then you have treatment to keep them having trouble. And long range, it's the allergy shots or immunotherapy uh, that is the two. How long do you have to take allergy shots? So it's a three to five year plan. So every, you have to get them how often? So it's a, the, the first year is the most time consuming. The first 13 weeks is what we call the buildup phase. You come in about two times a week during that buildup phase and then it's once a week for about eight months, and then we go every two year, every two weeks for about a year, then every three weeks for about six months, and then every four weeks for about six months to a year, and that puts us around the three-year mark. How good is immunotherapy? So they're 80% effective in controlling symptoms, um, and the goal of immunotherapy is to get good control of your symptoms, minimize reliance on medications, prevent development of new allergies, and it can also prevent the development and progression into asthma. So we're at five and six. Do, do people ever outgrow their allergies? Do the shots help them outgrow it? Or can they outgrow them by themselves? Does it come back? What's the future for this childhood asthmatic? Yeah, so the allergies won't go away unless we intervene. And so medications are effective but we have to rely them on a regular basis and they're just controlling the symptoms. Whereas immunotherapy is treating the underlying problem. So it can actually get rid of the allergic um, component. Karthik Christian, you're an excellent teacher, just absolutely excellent. Thank you for coming to the Dr. Bob Show. Tell, thanks for telling us that the wheezy infant can be treated and treated appropriately so that they can function normally and be an active, rambunctious young child. Thank you. Great information. You'll want to stay tuned. We're going to be talking about what does a blood pressure really tell you? A lot more than you think, and we'll go into that a little bit. And how 
obstructive sleep apnea. Obstructive sleep apnea harms the body because it can really harm other parts of the body, lead to heart attacks even. I want to thank Dr. Karthik Krishnan, board-certified allergist. Wonderful discussion on the wheezy infant and wheezing in young childhood. Now for questions from you, the viewer, that I think will be important to your health. Dr. Bob, tell me about blood pressure. Is it really as important as everybody says? Doesn't everybody have high blood pressure? Well, about 35% of people in the United States have an elevated blood pressure. What's a normal blood pressure? A normal blood pressure is 120 over 80. The upper number is when the heart pushes out blood against the blood vessels. The lower number is when the blood vessels completely rest. The number between 120 and 80 would be 40 points. We'll talk about later on if that pulse pressure gets bigger. Why do people get high blood pressure? What does high blood pressure do to the body? So the heart has to beat against high blood pressure. When it does that, eventually it's going to get tired. When the heart is beating against high blood pressure, it pounds on the blood vessels and it makes them susceptible to getting hardening of the arteries. The hardening of the arteries can occur in the brain, can occur in the kidneys, can in occur in the GI tract, the abdominal aortic, uh, abdominal aorta. And so those get hardening of the arteries, they can lead to strokes. They can lead to chronic kidney failure. They can lead to heart failure. They can lead to a bulging in the abdomen. And if that bulge breaks, you've only got about 45 seconds to live. So you have to be aware of those things. You have to be aware of your blood pressure. Now, 120 over 80 is normal. If you get above 145, or if you, the lower number, if you get above 85, you need to have treatment. What does treatment do, and how good is treatment, and how do we know if our blood pressure is getting high at home? Everybody that has high blood pressure, and I'm not sure that everybody in the United States shouldn't have a blood pressure cuff. This is one recommended by the American Heart Association. It's called an Omron IntelliSense. It's a digital, you push a button, it blows up the cuff, and then it lets the air come down. So this is the blood pressure cuff. You put that on the arm, push the button, it'll record your blood pressure. Now if the area between the two numbers, between 120 over 80, let's say it's 160 over 70, that's a wide pulse pressure. That could be to an, due to an overactive thyroid. There's a murmur called aortic insufficiency that you may get 160 over 40. So if you get those values, you tell your doctor and let him figure out what's going on with that. The blood pressure cup will usually tell you how fast your pulse is. A normal pulse is greater than 60 and less than 100. You need to know how to take your pulse. When you take your pulse, you need to be sure that the pulse is not irregular. If your heart is racing away, help your doctor know what it is. Know that you can take your pulse on one side of the neck or in the wrist or in the groin or in the brachial artery or on, even on the top of the foot. Let him know how fast and how irregular your heart rate is. They can put on a Holter monitor which measures your pulse and your the rate and the irregularity over a 24-hour period. There's so much information now that we can do. Question number two, Dr. Bob. How does obstructive sleep apnea harm the body? Well, everybody has heard the word now, obstructive sleep apnea. That's where we actually, people that are snores, the back of the tongue or the back of the throat falls against itself and it stops the breathing for five seconds. During that period of time, there is no oxygen. So it usually the brain says, hey, something bad's going on, wake up. So as we're snoring, we wake up with jerks. But while you were having the apnea, no breathing, the adrenal glands put out hormones. There is insulin resistance that occurs. So people get overweight. People get headaches from lack of oxygen. People get an irregular heart and get a heart attack during the night. If you've got obstructive sleep apnea, be sure 
that you talk to your doctor, that you get a sleep study, and you get that fixed. When you get that fixed, and it's usually with a CPAP, it can be with mouthpieces that bring forward the jaw, but work out something where you take care of that so that you'll live a better and a longer life. All the questions that, all the time we have for questions in this show. Remember to be exercising. Exercising will lower your blood pressure. Uh, it will help you lose weight. It'll make you feel better. It will relieve anxiety. It will relieve stress. It will get rid of some of the salt that's stored in the body. So know if you've got a lot of diseases that exercise is going to help. Talk to your doctor before you start the exercise program, but make it on a regular basis. Listen to your body when you exercise. Get seven and a half hours sleep. It's so important. You have to time when you're going to bed and when you wake up. And you got to be sure that you know how to relax in a quiet room with no lights, no reading, no iPads, no television in the bedroom. Eat properly, eat frequently, but eat small, small, small meals. Start the day off with a good breakfast. Don't skip breakfast. And most of all, what do we like? It's that laughter in your life. Laugh a lot, have fun, enjoy yourself, and you'll stay healthy.